Greetings and welcome back to Room 303 and AP English in our study of the world of ideas, the Jacobus text. This is lecture number 10 out of unit number 2, the unit on justice. We now turn to Thoreau's civil disobedience, uh, really one of the most important masterpieces in the history of great masterpieces. Uh, think about it, published in 1849, a year after Marx publishes Communist Manifesto. Think about that. We'll talk more about that text later. And uh, actually the essay was called Resistance to Civil Government as an original title. Well, one of the most important essays for really two reasons. One, um, it's compositional brilliance, and two, it's influence. I mean, think about this, we'll talk more about it, but, and we've mentioned it many times before, the universality of ideas. Thoreau will write this essay, Gandhi will pick it up and read it, we know what he does, and then Martin Luther King Jr. will use Gandhi's ideas that he borrowed from Thoreau. It's quite a remarkable thing. Now, again, several major assumptions here. One is that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, especially lectures one through nine, especially number eight, which treated uh, the narrative of Frederick Douglass, as well as I'm assuming that you are familiar with our previous lectures on Thoreau that I've already given at LearnStrong.net. You can search and easily find that especially in the junior folder, as well as my lectures on Emerson and transcendental ideas. All of those will be assumptions in our comments here, so that I'm not going to go into large detail. When I talk about, for example, the significance of Plato's theory of the forms as it relates to Kantian idealism, the two-box theory and all of that, I'm only going to be referencing that because my assumption is that you guys already have studied that with me. I'm also assuming learning theory, our uh, uh, attention to uh, connecting new information to old information in meaningful ways, the ideas um, uh, in, in annotative approaches of answering the three qu guiding questions. What does the text say? Summary, remember we're doing our paragraph summary. What does the text mean to a themes, messages, as well as our big five? What does this text say about epistemology, ontology, psychology, sociology, and then obviously theodicy as well? And then finally, level three, how can I relate to this information in some meaningful way? And I hope that we can do that at 3A by relating to other texts that we've already studied in World of Ideas and other texts in, in AP, and then, of course, other texts we know. And then finally, and I think most significantly to a text like this, because this is a very personal text. I mean, it's personal when we look at it. I'm actually going to enjoy reading a few lines out of this to just show some of the personal dimensions of a text like this. How can we relate it to ourselves personally? And then finally, the assumption... I hope that you will try and read this material on your own before you come to me and, uh, and work through it with me so that you're growing as both reader and writer. Thoreau, of course, would be challenging you to do that. Now, since I've already lectured on Thoreau elsewhere, I'll just go through real quickly the brief biography or dates again, 1817 uh, to 1862. Um, he started keeping a journal when he graduated from Harvard in 1837. And of course, we know about the famous Walden experience of 1854. Again, see my Learn Strong Lectures where I talk in, in, in detail about that, especially that energy conservation model that I share, uh, shared with you guys. Go back and take a look at that if you can't remember. His close pal, of course, and mentor is Ralph Waldo Emerson. Of course, I've given large numbers of lectures on Emerson, on the essays of Emerson. You can even hit my, um, my folder on, uh, on the Harvard Classics where I've given a, a, um, lectures on almost all of the Emerson essays and uh, views on transcendentalism as well as Plato's theory of the forms and the idealism that will be a part of that. Now, very influenced Thoreau was by several major, major strands of thought that are emphasized by Jacobus, and so I'll point them out to you. One is Immanuel Kant, the great uh, thinker of all thinkers, and many say the, the birth of modern philosophy beginning with his famous critiques, 1724 to 1804, in, in many ways, the idealism that Thoreau will borrow and share in, in, in this essay, in, in fact, will come out of Kant. The great English poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge, 1772 to 1834, learned strong lectures available for both Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner as well as Kubla Khan. And then Gouda as well, the great German philosopher and writer and poet, 1749 to 1803, or his number, or his, or his dates. Faust, and my treatment of Faust is available as well at Learn Strong. And then I would argue as well, I mean, 
uh, it's an amazing thing, the universality of ideas, but Thoreau goes to Walden, as we say in our lecture, carrying the Bhagavad Gita with him. Um, you know, you have the right to work, but for the work's sake only, you have no right to the fruits of your labor. Desire for the fruits must never be your motive in working. Never give way to laziness, either from the Bhagavad Gita uh, passage to, uh, to. Um, These are ideas that were very influential for, uh, for Thoreau. 1849, his resistance to civil government uh, leads to civil disobedience, the very essay that we're working with a year after publication, again, as we said, of the Communist Manifesto. So these ideas are percolating, this notion of standing up to uh, political structures that one feels are somehow unjust, very, very much a part of the air of the times. Now the background of this, uh, of this essay, as I have commented elsewhere in another lecture I've given on uh, civil disobedience, is his refusal, Thoreau's refusal, to pay taxes because of the, uh, the Mexican War. And he ends up for a night in jail because of this. And it's interesting to think about the relationship between this and then the text we'll study next, King's letter from a Birmingham jail. Um, again, he ends up in jail. There's always been debate about who got him out. Some will argue that it's his aunt who got him out. He doesn't say in civil disobedience who actually paid for getting him out. He himself didn't pay for it. Um, what is it that leads uh, to the writing of this essay? Really, it's, it, it, it's fundamentally, it's not about just the war. It's not about taxes. It's about Thoreau's strong abolitionist views as an individual, as a humanitarian, Go back to our comments on Frederick Douglass. He just couldn't believe that enlightened people believed that slavery was a legitimate uh, uh, political enterprise at all. For writing civil disobedience, the essay as we call it today, he of course becomes in some ways a criminal. The influence, as we've already said, is prodigious. And, and Jacob has points it out again. Gandhi, of course, his date's 1869 and then tragically assassinated in uh, 1948, will then of course share these ideas with the world and kings, Martin Luther King Jr. will come to them as well. And uh, as well the influence of this essay is prodigious any time. I mean, we live in a political climate of unrest, no question, as if there's another political climate, right? But no question that often people who are wanting to resist government will come back to the line of arguments here. Speaking of arguments, let's talk rhetoric really quickly. Now, Thoreau wasn't just a great writer, he was also a great speaker, the Lyceum is mentioned, um, and like Emerson, he very much believed that if you're going to write ideas, you want to be able to share those ideas publicly, and so this essay will read in some ways as if it is a speech. Thoreau was a constant reviser of his stuff, in February of 1848, he lectures on civil disobedience, and then Elizabeth Peabody, her dates 1804 to 1894, who is the sister-in-law of Nathaniel Hawthorne, of course we know about Hawthorne well, we have a number of lectures on Learn Strong for him, will publish the essay in Aesthetic Papers. His message is, and Jacob has points this out, rhetorically speaking, um, there's, there's, uh, it's clear, it's anarchistic in some ways, no question. It is denying in many ways that an unjust government has any authority or respect. And so that's the tone, the mood of this essay. It is a very combative kind of essay in that regards. But its language is marked by remarkable clarity, very much like Douglas. It's not a difficult essay to read and understand what he's doing. It's memorable. Um, he will quote, interestingly, John L. O'Sullivan in the opening lines that the government is best which governs least. Notice, even in that line, the repetition, government, governs, right, as well as the near rhyme of best and least. The balance, the repetition, the patterns are all being emphasized. In fact, I'll read just a few uh, lines here from page 125, 126 of Jacobus's view here. Speaking of Thoreau, Thoreau's most memorable statements show considerable attention to the rhetorical qualities, as I said, of a balance, repetition, pattern. The only obligation, quoting now, the only obligation which I have to assume is to do at any time what I think right, In quote from paragraph four. You notice uses the word right in two senses. First as a matter of personal volition, second as a matter of moral rectitude. One's right, in other words, becomes the opportunity to do right. Notice another quote from paragraph 21. For it matters not how small the beginning may seem to be, what is once well done is done forever, in quote, paragraph 21. There's so many lines from this essay that become part of American parlance. Now, notice this line also relies on repetition for its effect and balances the concept of a beginning with its capacity to reach out into the future. We also notice we'll have the use of the rhetorical device as shemes, a crisscross relationship between key words, marks, 
under a government which imprisons any unjustly, the true place for a just man is also a prison, paragraph 22. And then notice that they, the, the paragraph here on page 126 will demonstrate this crossing action. So imprisons, dot, 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 unjustly, and then down below, unjust, dot, 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 prison, and then notice how prisons and imprisons will go with just unjustly and just man. Now notice this attention to paraphrasing is typical of speakers who expressions must catch and retain the attentions of listeners. We're going to see this when we study, obviously, as we have already studied, Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech, or, of course, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. We have similar kinds of understandings of the rhetorical tendencies. Audiences do not have the advantage, of course, when they're listening, of referring to a text, so the words have to, have to be forceful in the moment that they hear them. Of course, no, no question, we also have the arguments from analogy, just to finish um, um, the role of questions, uh, and, and, and his questions will include comments on politics, paragraph 1, the Bible, paragraph 23, Confucius, paragraph 24, finally his contemporary Daniel Webster, paragraph 42, demonstrating a wide range of influences, and no, no writer has ever been, I think, as, as influenced, and was able to kind of bring it all up and then share it out uh, the, way, the way that Thoreau was able to do that. Demonstrating a wide range of influences by avoiding the pedantic tone, in other words, he's not preaching, that can come from using quotations too liberally or from citing obscure sources. The essay is simple, direct, and cluttered. I think that's important for your notes. Its enduring influence is in part due to the clarity and grace that characterizes Thoreau's writing at its best, and of course we know about this from our study of Walden. Its power derives from Thoreau's demand that citizens act on the basis of conscience, and of course that's the key notion, right, to, throughout this entire essay. Let's turn now to a real quick summary of this, uh, of this, and let's just enjoy the first paragraph together, shall we? I'm on page 127. The opening lines of civil disobedience, often, so often quoted, some things missed though, let's, let's point out. I heartily accept the motto, and now here he quotes uh, John L. O'Sullivan, just to point out, pay attention to your footnotes as you're reading, okay? Um, I heartily accept the motto, that government is best, which governs least. And I should like to see it acted upon to more rapidly and systematically carried out. It finally amounts to this, which also I believe, that government is best which governs not at all. Well, so the notion of limited small government derives in large measure from an essay like this one, no question. Notice to continue. He says, and when men are prepared for it, and that's a key line that's so often overlooked, the power and the value of education, that will be the kind of government which they will have. Government is at best but an expediency. An expedient, I'm sorry. But most governments are usually, and all governments are sometimes inexpedient. The objections which have been brought against the standing army, and they are many and waiting, and deserve to prevail, may also at last be brought against the standing government. The standing army is only an arm of the standing government. The government itself, which is only the mode which the people have chosen to execute their will, go back to our comments of Jefferson's Declaration of Independence, is equally liable to be abused and perverted before the people can act through it. Witness the present America, uh, Mexican War, the present Mexican War, the work of comparatively a few individuals using the standing government as their tool, but for in the outset the people would not have consented to this measure. This is this argument of limited government, and as we now turn to it, it's, it's crucial. Let's go through it. Governments like armies, he will argue in paragraphs 1 and 2, are a means for the people to express their will, but also may be used uh, by a few against the people's interests. Governments do not act, but facilitate or impede action by individuals and groups. Paragraphs 3 through 6, we need not immediately abolish government, but should improve it. Governments rule by majority, not by justice, and thus may imp improperly overrule individual conscience. John Stuart Mill and On Liberty put it in 3A right away. is going to be important for our understanding of this one. Turning men into tools of the government. Those who follow their consciences and resist the government are treated as enemies by it. You'll remember, go back to our comments on Emily Dickinson, much madness is divine as sense to a discerning eye. That notion, you're, you're, you're straightway handled with a chain if you stand up to the majority. This will be a very transcendental idea. Of course, Thoreau and, and Dickinson are contemporaries, no question. Let's concentrate now on paragraphs 7 through 15. And I, and I want to actually just turn to some of paragraph 7 because 
Um, you know, it's, it's a brilliant little paragraph. I mean, just take a look at the transitional paragraph. How does it become a man to behave towards this American government today? It's, a, it's an interesting and a rhetorical question. I think one of the reasons this essay remains so timeless is it's timeless. It speaks even to our time. I answer that he cannot, without disgrace, be associated with it. I cannot for an instant recognize that political organization as my government, which is the slave's government also. And here is really the heart of his argument. It is an abolitionist's argument, no question about it. Now, paragraph 7 through 15, he says, The present American government which supports slavery forces men of conscience into resistance. Those who fail to oppose wrongdoing with action, but simply voice or vote their convictions, are leaving justice to chance. Martin Luther King Jr. will make the same argument in a letter from a Birmingham jail. A real man refuses allegiance on any level to a government that pursues immoral policies. Let's turn now to paragraphs 16 through 19. Let's pick up again with the arguments and uh, just take a look at paragraph 16 and the brilliance of this paragraph. Unjust laws exist. We're back to our study of Sophocles and Antigone, aren't we, in 3a? Unjust laws exist. Shall we be content to obey them or shall we endeavor to amend them and obey them until we have succeeded or shall we transgress them at once? Men, generally, under such a government as this think that they ought to wait until they have persuaded the majority to alter them. They think that if they should resist the remedy would be worse than the evil. It makes it worse. King will pick up with this in letter from a Birmingham jail. Why is it not more apt to anticipate and provide for reform? Why does it not cherish its wise minority? Why does it cry and resist before it is heard. Notice this repetition of the word why in the questions that are being provided here. Why does it not encourage its citizens to be on the alert, to point out its faults and do better than it would have them? Why does it always crucify Christ and excommunicate Copernicus and Luther and pronounce Washington and Franklin rebels? Woo! This is some brilliant rhetoric. And of course, for those of you who followed my stuff on Emerson and his essay, Self-Reliance, we're playing a very similar game of listing the heroes of ideas, no doubt. Let's go to work now with paragraphs uh, 16 through 19. Those in Massachusetts here are, I'm sorry, we should not be deterred from rebelling against unjust laws or persuaded to uh, wait for a majority vote to change them by our fear of causing more harm than good. A just government would prevent such harm in its absence we should concern ourselves with living justly and not with reforming the gov and not with reforming the government. Let's turn now to paragraphs 20 through 24, and um, and and I'm going to be I'm going to pay attention here in a moment to uh, paragraph 22 because it's such an important one. He argues that people who are living in Massachusetts who believe in abolishing slavery would withdraw their support from the state, refusing to pay taxes and going willingly to prison. And obviously, Thoreau actually did this, right? He says, money prevents the man who has it from living in accord with his convictions. Anyone who needs the government's protection is reluctant to disobey its laws. Let's just pay attention to a passage at the end of uh, paragraph 22. I'm on page 136. He says, if the tax gatherer or any other public officer asks me, as one has done, but what shall I do? My answer is, if you really wish to do anything, resign your office. The same thing that, of course, Gandhi will have said when he was brought in front of a tribunal once. When the subject has refused allegiance and the officer has reassigned his office, when the revel then the revolution is accomplished. But even suppose blood should flow, is there not a sort of bloodshed when the conscience is wounded? Through this wound, a man's real manhood and immortality flow out, and he bleeds to an everlasting death. I see this blood flowing. Now, notice this is compelling language, and of course, pay attention to our dates here as it relates to the American Civil War. No question, right? That this is an important essay in that regards as well. Paragraphs 25 through 37, he says, I myself having little property, have declined to pay various taxes and was once imprisoned overnight, he says. In jail, he says, I saw the barriers between me and my neighbors and particularly between me and the state. My perspective on my town became that of a foreign traveler which lasted even after someone paid my tax and I was released. I'll go to paragraph 27 on page 139. He says it this way, thus the state 
never intentionally confronts a man's sense, intellectual or moral, but only his body, his senses. It is not armed with superior wit or honesty, but with superior physical strength. I was not born to be forced. Again, this notion, I, I've said it in my, in my lectures on American thought, don't tell me what to do is fundamental to what it means to be an American. No question about it. And when an American stands up to the government and says, don't tell me what to do, that individual is living out the fundamental notion of what it means to be an American. And notice here, he says, I was not born to be forced. I will breathe after my own fashion. Let us see who is the strongest. What force has a multitude? They only can force me who obey a higher law than I. Antigone said the same thing in Sophocles' play, didn't she? They force me to become like themselves. I do not hear of men being forced to live this way or that by masses of men. What sort of life were that to live? When I meet a government which says to me, your money or your life, why should I be in haste to give it my money? It may be in a great strait and not know what to do. I cannot help that. It must help itself. Do as I do. It is not worth the while to snivel about it. I'm not responsible for the successful working of the machinery of society. I am not the son of the engineer. I perceive that when an acorn and a chestnut fall side by side, the one does not remain inert to make way for the other, but both obey their own laws and spring and grow and flourish as best they can till one perchance overshadows and destroys the other. If a plant cannot live according to its nature, it dies. And so a man. Note the powerful metaphor here of the idea of humans being somewhat like trees. Takes us back, of course, to our study of, of Plato, individuals being somewhat like uh, of the state and the state being somewhat like in individuals. I want to jump over to, to um, the paragraph 36 really quickly because I think this is, one of the, this is one of the most brilliantly constructed paragraphs of the essay. Take a look at it. Uh, I'm with you on one, page 142. I've never declined paying the highway tax because, I, because I'm as desirous of being a good neighbor as I am of being a, a bad subject. And as for supporting schools, I'm doing my part to educate my fellow countrymen now. Note the irony of that, right? It is for no particular item in the tax bill that I refuse to pay it. I simply wish to refuse allegiance to the state to withdraw and stand aloof from it effectually.